Well, it's great to be here in Birmingham. Uh, thank you for having me. Please forgive my uh, lack of necktie. Uh, my neighbor, who I usually borrow one from for events like this, was on vacation. So <laughs> <laughs> kind of proud that I don't really own a necktie. But uh, anyway, um, you, you know, my first impression of Birmingham uh, came back in 1973. Uh, it was also my first introduction to SEC football. As you guys know, uh, playing on the left coast, uh, we came down here to play against uh, the University of Alabama a couple miles over here at Legion Field. And I can remember when the police escort met us at the airport, um, I thought maybe they were going to arrest a few of my teammates, but uh, <laughs> they were there to, to take us to the hotel. The night before the game, we went to a, we went to a movie, we watched the movie, and uh, it, nothing that the coaching staff could say could prepare us for what we were going to experience that Saturday night at Legion Field. Uh, it was nothing short of incredible. Um, they whooped us like uh, we were a high school Class A team. I mean, it was ugly. 66 to nothing. They had, there, there had to be 80,000 screaming people dressed in red, uh, not very hospitable at all. I've heard so much about Southern hospitality, but I guess you draw the line at the football game. But uh, I can remember looking across the field. Uh, there were 120 guys they dressed out for that game, uh, all scholarship guys. Uh, that was before it, a long time ago when uh, you could, when the, when the bear would, he would go out and, and hire guys that he knew when, couldn't play for him, but he'd you know, hire them just so they couldn't play against him. So, uh, we had 47 guys. Um, it was a uh, massacre of uh, epic proportions, for sure. Um, I, I've been back to Birmingham a number of times since then, and uh, I got to tell you, it's my second favorite city in the South. I, I love this. I love this community. I love the uh, sense of community here, and uh, I'm glad to be here to uh, have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my life and tell you a little bit about my journey, and then uh, we'll have some time for questions. Um, and I'm sure that uh, everybody wants to know about my eight no Atlanta Falcons and uh, what the secret is. It's, uh, it's been fun to watch. Um, you know, if I seem a little bit nervous, um, it's only because the uh, 11 years that I played for the Atlanta Falcons, I didn't have a chance to play in front of this big of a crowd, generally. <laughs> so this is kind of a new and unique experience for me. Uh, Things have changed vastly over the years. Uh, thank God for Arthur Blank stepping in and buying that franchise and putting it in the right direction. Well, Pat kind of covered a lot of the bases uh, of my life's journey. Um, I mean, I, I can remember when I was six years old telling my dad I wanted to be an athlete. My dad was a uh, baseball player, played in the Chicago Cubs organization for nine years, so I had an incredible tutor at home, a mentor uh, in every sense of the word, and the best coach I ever played for in my entire athletic career. He, uh, he bought into that dream when I told him that. Uh, I think he kind of shook his head and, you know, kind of said to himself, you, you don't have any idea what you're in for. This is a heck of a journey. But uh, he never let on that it was anything less than his goal as well as mine. Um, I was very fortunate to grow up in a home like that. Uh, I can remember my dad was a carpenter when he finished uh, playing professional baseball, and I can remember meeting him at the front door. <clears throat> You know, he'd come home from working a long day and, and uh, had his lunch bucket and thermos, and, and uh, I'd be there with my baseball glove and bat and see if uh, he would take me down to the park and hit me some grounders before it got dark. Um, and, you know, he never, ever, ever turned me down. Uh, it was a tremendous role model for me, a tremendous uh, you know, uh, influence on my life and a guy who really bought into my dream. I only say that to say this, that as a dad, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity for us to really uh, be the mentors that our children need. Um, even as a grandfather now, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm starting to understand just the kind of impact that we can have in our kids' lives. So take that for what it's worth. By the time I graduated from high school, I was playing ahead of my peer group because of my dad and because of his coaching. Uh, and I was moderately athletically talented, but I was always playing with kids that were older than me growing up. I can remember playing in Little League Baseball uh, in the 11 and 12 year old when I was eight years old. So uh, my dad sort of kept me ahead of my peer group because he was so intensely involved in my growth and development. Um, by the time I graduated from high school, I made uh, uh, All-State in uh, California where I grew up uh, in Northern California, made All-State in baseball, football, and basketball, and uh, had, like Pat said, about 100 different scholarship offers to mull over. 
The one thing I did know is I was going to stay close enough to home that I could tap into my coach. So uh, Berkeley was only 50 miles up the, up the road, and that's where I chose to go to school. Now, that was a little bit of a strange place for me to end up because uh, Cal was noted more for its academics than it was for its athletics, and I was noted more for my athletics than I was for my academics. So it wasn't exactly a match made in heaven, if you know what I mean. Matter of fact, I can remember the dean of students calling me into his office after uh, my freshman football season, and uh, I figured he was going to slap me on the back, tell me how good I was, and, and uh, you know, just like everybody else was doing at Cal. But he sat me down at a desk in front of, or a chair in front of his desk, and he, and he said, son, he said, you're having a good time here at Cal, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I sure am. This is a great place. He said, I can tell him. He, was, he, he had in his hand my transcripts, and he said, Son, you better knuckle down. He said, uh, there's a chance that you might become the first freshman road scholar in the history of this university. He said, I'm going to put you on the road back down to Santa Clara <laughs> if you don't get it right here. It's a good wake-up call for me. Um, and uh, needless to say, I, I sort of uh, uh, got, got in line, I guess uh, you might say. I mean, it was a tremendous place to go to school. I played both baseball and football there. Made All-American in both sports, baseball as a sophomore and, and as the consensus All-American quarterback in the, uh, my senior year in, at Cal. Had a choice to make coming out as which sport I was going to play professionally. I, you know, just for the sake of argument, I'll put you in my shoes and see what you had picked. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles drafted me in the 19th round. They offered me $500 a month and a chance to go down to Florida to play in the Class A Rookie Leagues, which is the lowest form of minor league baseball. The Atlanta Falcons made me the first pick in the draft and offered me $600,000 and a chance to come down to Atlanta and throw touchdowns for a living. So you can see the economic dilemma <laughs> I was faced with. Not much of a choice, really. Certainly not a choice a la Bo Jackson uh, and some of the other guys that have come along uh, after me. But uh, I did what every one of you would have done. Took the uh, economic deal, and uh, the best economic deal, and, and uh, signed up to play for Atlanta. Now, my first three years in Atlanta, I spent more time in Piedmont Hospital recuperating from various sorts of injuries that I did uh, throwing touchdowns. Uh, had an elbow injury, elbow injury my rookie year uh, and uh, still went on and made rookie of the year that year. Uh, and then I had back-to-back -back knee uh, injuries, which uh, shortened my season. I only played in about half the regular season games due to injury my first three years. And I guess it was about that time I was starting to think, you know, now maybe that, uh, maybe that Baltimore Oriole offer was the best one after all. But I knew it was too late to turn back. I'd made a career choice, and I was going to be a quarterback. And if I you know, was going to do that, it, 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 would had to, it had to start happening in my fourth year. Now, the fourth year in a quarterback's life in the NFL is a year that they say he's supposed to come into his own. I'm not exactly sure what all that entails, but I think it has something to do with remembering what color jersey your buddies have on for that weekend. <laughs> you see, I had this issue uh, where I'd kind of throw it to their guys about as much as I was throwing it to our guys, and uh, that's not good. Uh, finally, the fifth preseason game that, that year against the Philadelphia Eagles, I was looking at the team stats before the game, and I was leading the team in tackles, and, uh, <laughs> which is never a good thing. And it was billed as Bart's last chance. I had to play well or I was going to lose my job. Now, I, I can't even begin to tell you, I've never been on the hot seat like that. I've never been in a circumstance like that where, uh, you know, I just had to play well, and the pressure was on, and... I, you know, I studied game film. I did everything I was supposed to do, preparing for that game. I knew more about Philadelphia than they probably knew about themselves. And I went out there and proceeded to play what the head coach at that point in time, Lehman Bennett, called the worst game he'd ever seen a quarterback play. Uh, it was awful. It started out bad and got worse. Um, I remember midway through the third quarter, I dropped back and hit one of their players for a touchdown. Now, um, <laughs> Now, wait, now, you know, the defensive backs and linebackers, they have a chance to step in front of one from time to time. But I threw it to a defensive end, a little <laughs> swing pass. And uh, it just got worse. And uh, I can remember walking off the field at the end of that game and uh, looking up in the stands. That's the worst thing you can do when it's, uh, you're on your home turf and people don't love you. And there was one old guy who was standing up there shaking his fist and yelling my name louder than all his buddies around him. He's said, Barkowski, you're the worst quarterback in Atlanta I've ever had like that, you know. And I... You know, I mean, it was, caught me at a bad time, right, guys? I mean, uh, not a good time to be critiquing me in front of his friends as I was in front of my buddies trying to get in the locker room. And he was only about 10 rows up there, so I, you know, hiked my leg up, in that uh, up over that stadium railing, and I was headed up there. I was going to grab him around the shirt collar and show him how bad I really was. One of the guys on the team grabbed me by the shoulder pad. He said, Bart, don't mess with that guy. You can see he's nothing but an old drunk. And I looked up at him. I said, buddy, you're nothing but an old drunk. And he looked back down at me and he said, yeah, he said, but I'll be better in the morning, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Maybe he wasn't as drunk as I thought he was, huh? <laughs> well, I got in the locker room after that game, you know, and, I, and knowing that, that my career had collapsed in front of my own eyes in just four short years and, uh, you know, not really coming up with any answers, you know, put my head in my hands and cried for almost two hours after that game ended. The whole time I was sitting there crying, I was doing sort of personal inventory, wondering where in the world I made the wrong turn, what had happened to the athletic talent that made me the first pick in the draft. Why couldn't I get it done anymore on the football field? I didn't come up with any answers at that point in time, but I got started home. And on the way home from the stadium that night, God supernaturally brought back an incident that had happened three years earlier. I was a part of the college all-star team. We were preparing to play the game that usually kicked off the National Football League season. A group of college all-stars, consensus All-Americans, got together and played the previous year's world champions. And a guy caught me, this guy caught me in the lobby of the hotel after practice one day in Northwestern University and came up to me and said, asked me if he could spend a few minutes with me. I, I looked at the guy, I said, come on, buddy. I said, I, I got things to do, man. I said, but there was a lot of press around, and I figured, well, this guy was just another scribe, and I might give him some time. So I said, what do you want to share with me? He said, I want to share with you God's plan for your life. Well, <laughs> I didn't have time for that, but I listened, and uh, I, I left, and, and I was, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I was sitting there scratching my head and wondering how this guy was telling me how to find an abundant life, and I was just the first pick in the draft. Just signed the Richard Rookie contract. They've been signed the National Football League, and man, everything I ever had a goal for, I'd achieved. And I was thinking, man, you know, you might want to take that message out to that guy who's sleeping by the dumpster. You know, I didn't say that out loud, but that's what I was thinking. I said, get out of my way. I'm on the way to the top. Well, guess what? That was three. That was 1975, and, and in 1978, the you know, circumstances had drastically changed for this old boy. And when God supernaturally brought that incident back to my mind, I knew there was something I had to do that night. I had to get home and sort of fall on my face before God and say, look, Lord, if there's something you have for me, I want to experience it. I want to experience it in every way I can. I went to bed and woke up the next morning. I was kind of hoping that God might change the headlines, but it still said Bart sucks right there in <laughs> the AJC. But I went back to work with sort of a renewed optimism, a renewed, renewed enthusiasm, and I felt like I had the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders, you know. Uh, it was one of those deals where I was just trying too hard to be something I wasn't. And, uh, you know, at that point, uh, I just rededicated myself. I said, Lord, I said, if you want me roofing houses, that's fine. I said, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad. my dad was a carpenter, the finest man I've ever known. I'm happy to do that. But if you want me throwing touchdowns, you better prescribe a way for me to get back to the top of that depth chart. Two weeks later, I had my job back and went on, took the Falcons to the uh, playoffs that year in 1978, first time in franchise history. And I went on and played nine more years um, as what I like to refer to as a business under new management. Uh, there was just a new, uh, a, a new attitude, a, a new way. Um, yeah, I mean, I was a new guy. I mean, it was just different for me. I, it wasn't, no, wasn't any longer how much money I could make, how many touchdowns I could throw for, uh, how many you know people... Uh, you know, I could influence one way or the other. It was all about just doing what God wanted me to do. Um, went on, and like I said, and made all pro a couple different times, uh, led the league in passing on three different occasions. Uh, every other goal sort of that I had horizontally took care of itself once I had that vertical relationship right with the one who gave me life to start with. So it was a sort of a neat uh, journey for me to uh, have a chance to uh, really hear with my heart what I'd heard with my ears three years earlier there in 1978 as I was driving home dejected from that stadium uh, after losing my job. Well, I've had a, a, the most incredible life that anybody could ever hope for. Um, uh, you know, it hasn't all been roses. As a matter of fact, there's, uh, there's been some issues uh, that I've had along the way. I was diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer uh, six years ago now. Um, and uh, 52 years old at that point. I remember driving home from the exam, the, uh, the uh, colonoscopy, and the, and the doctor giving me the news that uh, we had a battle. We had an uphill kind of battle ahead of us. I can remember thinking, man, you know, I mean, if it, at 52 years is all I get, I've had the greatest 52 years that any, anybody could ever hope for. You know, I mean, I've just, uh, I, I've lived uh, a, a life that, that, you know, people could live for centuries and not experience what I've experienced in my short life. So if it's over now, God, it's over. That's, that's fine with me. But I got a wife, I got a, two great kids, I got a little granddaughter, didn't have her, but I knew she was in the oven at that point in time, and it was, uh, it was pretty important for me to just kind of plug in and, and trudge uphill, if that's what it took to get through that, to, uh, through that uh, experience. Well, the tumor was uh, uh, went through the chemo and radiation, and the tumor was resected, and you know, I got a clean bill of health for the fifth year in a row now, sixth year in a row, I guess it's been now. So 
um, you know, there's, there's, there's some struggles still, you know. I mean, as a Christian, uh, you know, you still experience what everybody else in life experiences. There's just a, a new attitude, I think, that you take the uh, challenges on with. And, uh, yeah, it, as Pat made reference, to, you know, I, I've, uh, you know, I guess my one goal uh, in life, uh, kind of an unspoken goal, is to try to make it through without ever having a real job. Uh, so far, so good. I mean, uh, I played uh, football for 12 years in the National Football League. After I finished that, I kind of licked my wounds for two years before I did anything else. And then I, I did a little outdoor television show for about seven years where they actually paid me to go hunting and fishing. Um, if you can imagine that. I mean, uh, I remember as a kid watching Kurt Gowdy on the American Sportsman and thinking, that's a job I want right there. Well, I had a chance to experience that as well. And uh, yeah, a few years uh, after uh, my kids kind of got up to that age where I was missing a ball game or two, you know, because I had to be out filming a show, uh, I got convicted. I got convicted because my mentor, my dad, he never missed one of my games. I had to put that down. So I went to work for a, a great construction firm, and I've uh, been there and uh, kind of stealing money from them for the last 16 years and just uh, loving every minute of it. Uh, you know, the guy that hired me said, look, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm you know, hunting and fishing and golfing, and, you know, I, he said, well, you know, drop the cameras and come on and do that with my customers. So uh, I said, hey, it sounds like a deal for me. I'd be home every night, sleep in my own bed, watch my kids grow up, and, uh, you know, be the kind of dad my dad was to me. So uh, anyway, I have had just, uh, you know, one of those lives that's just been so blessed, and I'm so grateful um, that there are still people who would want to come and hear a story of this old worn-out quarterback, uh, a guy who uh, uh, really was sort of a marginal player, you know. I mean, I, you know, I had some athletic ability, but listen, guys, you all know as well as I do, man, it ain't all about you. It's not all about you in any, any sort of business. Unless you invent something or you're a tennis player or a golfer, those are the only things that I can think of that, you know, you don't need other people, you know. But we all need other people. And, man, a quarterback's life is... So indicative of that. I mean, it's, you play the hand you're dealt, right? I mean, you can't change the fact that maybe you were in an organization that wasn't pointed in the right direction. You can't change the fact that maybe you're playing with a group of guys that are less talented than those guys you're lining up against. But the thing you can do is you can give everything you got and then recognize the fact that your success is based on the success of those around you. I think that's a big part of the reason I got elected to the College Football Hall of Fame. I, you know, I had a terrific time at the University of California, but I had, more than that, I had a terrific group of teammates. I mean, I had some guys that really, we were like a band of brothers. And uh, when you experience that, it's pretty special. It's, uh, it's unique, uh, but it's very special. And, and it's no different. Football team is no different than a business. You're only as good as the people around you. So keep that in mind and stay humble and uh, stay successful. And uh, keep doing what you're doing here for the community of Birmingham. Uh, you guys do a wonderful job here. Uh, there's a lot of people profit from uh, the efforts that you guys make uh, from a financial standpoint. Uh, it's certainly, uh, you, you are much to be admired, and I'm grateful for all that you do. Uh, with all that said, I would like to open up the last 15 minutes, and I promise I'll get you out of here at 1 o'clock to sort of answer any questions if you guys have some questions. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about my Atlanta Falcons. I serve on the board and very closely connected. Of course, if they were 0-8, I'd tell you, well, let's not talk about that right now. <laughs> but uh, since they're 8-0, no, it's, a, it's a fun conversation. And I know there's a tremendous amount of Falcon fans right here in Birmingham. Yes, sir. Yeah, talk about having Roddy White and Julio Jones. Well, talk about being a kid in a candy store. I mean, Matt Ryan has got, uh, you know, you ought to see Matt's eyes light up when he starts talking about those guys. I mean, they are, uh, they are very, both very special players. Uh, you know, they complement each other extremely well. Uh, they like each other, which is unusual. Uh, there's only one football. It's hard to keep those kind of guys happy, you know. Uh, you've got Tony Gonzalez in the middle that might be the best tight end to ever play the game. Uh, so, Matt, I, you know, he's done a masterful job of getting those guys involved, and I think they realize that they're only as good as that guy on the other side. And, you know, the more times Julio gets doubled means the more time that uh, Roddy's got one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a, it's a good situation. We've got a great locker room. I mean, we've got an incredible locker room. Guys really like each other. You know, I mean, they really enjoy going to war with each other. And, uh, you know, they check their ego at the door. Um, it, it, Mike Smith is an incredible mentor. Um, 
I would have loved to have played for a head coach like Mike. He's got the blinders on. You know, the next game is the Super Bowl. The next game. I mean, there ain't no, but the next game against the New Orleans Saints is the Super Bowl for Mike. That's the way he approaches every week. Anybody? Josh Harris, I have not personally uh, admire. Uh, you know, I mean, we we uh, you know we have uh, you know obviously we want to keep the kids as close to home as we possibly can. You know, as Atlanta Falcons uh, organization, it's it's great to have guys like Josh. You know, we, we've got uh, a ton of SEC guys and you know and, and on the football team, so uh, it's uh, it's great having him there. Yes. Uh, he, it's just a typical Spurrier deal. He's a, <laughs> he, he is, he's been brain dead for years. They just nobody's told him that yet. <laughs> now, I, I love Steve. I love Steve. He's one of my favorite guys, and he, you know, he has a flair for the outrageous. And uh, I'm telling you, that's outrageous. There's uh, Alabama's good, but I'm telling you what, man. I mean, there is a step up that I can't even begin to tell you. You think from going from high school to college is a big step up? Whew. Man, you're up about another 30 stories, man, stepping up to that next level. You're playing against all-stars every week. You're playing against guys that, uh, that are the best of the best. Uh, so I would give them uh, – let me set the point spread on that one against the, the worst team, the Jacksonville Jaguars, you know, or whoever. Let's pick one. Uh, no chance. No chance. Now, if they said that in the NBA, I might change my mind. You know, you, I think Kentucky had six guys drafted, you know, went in the – whatever the draft was. You know, I mean – now, I tell you that, you take those six guys and you could probably make a, a pretty good run at, uh, I don't know, pick, pick the last place team, uh, Raptors or whoever they might be. Yes, sir, in the back. Somebody said that the only team that could beat the pros was Spurrier's last Washington Yeah, 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 that's pretty good. He said the only, the only team that could maybe, uh, that Alabama might be able to beat was the team he coached when he was at the Washington Redskins. <laughs> they, they, they might have a chance. They might have a chance. Yes, sir. What makes a good owner in the pros? Uh, well, I think uh, I, I, I can only go, I mean, I saw both ends of it. I saw an owner that was incredibly disinterested, would rarely come to any of the way games, came to most of the home games, never showed up at practice. Uh, a guy who just, just really wasn't in it to win it, you know, uh, the guy that we have now, I'm telling you, this is his passion. It's his pride and joy. Arthur Blank, uh, you know, he has done nothing in his life halfway. And uh, he, is, he is totally uh, all in, whatever, whatever the team needs, you know, um, put in the right organization. He's out of practice probably two or three days a week. He's, you know, he's down there on the sidelines encouraging those guys toward the end of the game. Um, I think that means so much. Because it's really, really hard, in no matter what your business is, to rise above management. You can't, you, I mean, they have to set the bar high. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're working for somebody who, yeah, you know, we're going to be moderately good. You know, we just want to, you know, collect our 132nd of what the NFL spreads around. And I'm going to tell you, that will be reflected in the way that your team plays, some, some way, somehow. And uh, in the NFL, I'm telling you, it, I, I used to tell our the previous owner, I said, man, if you just come and show people it meant something to you, you don't have to pay these guys a lot of money, but slap them on the butt and tell them how much you appreciate the way that you, the effort they're putting forth. I mean, that goes so much further than a $10,000 bonus or whatever. Um, but I think that's it. I think that's what's yeah. – and, and, and it's hard to find a bad owner in the National Football League now. I mean, it's so competitive. Most of these guys are in it because they got huge egos. They all want to hoist the Lombardi Trophy. But there's some guys that have a, have a game plan. They have a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a mode of operation that gives their team a better chance to win. And I think that's what Arthur Blank does for the Atlanta Falcons. Yes, sir? Along that same line, how much is Oakland missing out there? Uh, well, I would, if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago when Al was really plugged in and didn't have those uh, blackout times, uh, you know, Al toward the end was, was probably uh, not as uh, uh, football savvy as he once was as a young guy. You know, I mean, he built a tremendous uh, franchise out there. There's no question about it. But I think he made some, some knee-jerk reactions to some things. Uh, uh, I think, you know, Oakland, I kind of grew up watching that team. That was the first pro game I ever went to uh, back when Madden was coaching and, and Al was uh, really riding on the high horse. 
Uh, I think it's had a it's had a tremendous impact on that organization. Losing him, no question about it. But it's uh, what they need to do is clean up the stand the fan base. Is what they need to do. That's the scariest place in the world to go to a football game. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. Say again. Oh, my, my opinion on the bounty situation in New Orleans, I, you know, the, the game is brutal enough as it, as it stands. There doesn't need to be any extra incentive for these guys. Um, I think it's, it's a travesty that it, that it happened. Um, you know, there, there are reward programs. Every team has them, you know, where you, you know, a big hit or, a, you know, an interception, a fumble, you know, uh, you know, a kick return for a touchdown, you know, there's a couple hundred bucks here and there, you know. But, but to have, you know, to, to have guys amped up to go take a guy out of the game, uh, and have a, some sort of a reward. That, there's just no place in the game for that, uh, in my opinion. Um, and they're paying, they're paying the price. Yes, sir. If I should call you for a reference on Bobby Petrino, what would you say? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> well, are you thinking Kentucky might be, uh, the phone might be ringing? Well, I'd say, okay, no motorcycles, no affairs. Uh, that, now, you know, I, I mean, Bobby's an interesting guy. I, I, I didn't get to know him very well because he wasn't there long enough. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a uh, – uh, he, he's a brilliant offensive mind. He really is. I mean, he, he will give you a chance to win offensively. Now, I don't know that I want my kid spending four years under him. Um, you know, I, I'd have a hard time recommending him because Bobby's always been that guy that's looking for the next best deal, you know, and uh, I don't think that will ever change. As they say, as Yogi said, a, a, a leopard, Yogi Berra said, a leopard can't change his stripes. <laughs> hey, Steve. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your opinion about the concussion uh, discussions in the NFL? My opinion about the concussion discussions in the NFL. <laughs> Uh, well, they're finally paying attention to it. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, for years and years and years has just sort of been swept under the rug. But uh, we're starting to, I mean, mod modern medical science has shown us that, uh, that the brain is a very, uh, um, how do I want to say, it, it's an intricate mechanism that is really susceptible to multiple uh, trauma, head trauma. And I think that, you know, Roger Goodell is trying to do everything he can to, to clean it up. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, locking the, locking the barn door when the horse is already out. Uh, there's been a lot of water under a lot of people's bridges. And uh, a lot of guys, I, I lost a teammate this year, a guy by the name of Ray Easterling, who played free safety for us for eight years over in Atlanta. And uh, I saw Ray at a reunion about three years ago, and, and he was uh, early onset dementia, was diagnosed with, and... I mean, it, it, Ray could not carry on a conversation. He literally could not. And, uh, you know, I think the NFL is, uh, you know, to some degree liable for what they knew, when they knew it, and I think that's probably going to be coming out at some point in time. But i got to tell you, the commissioner has jumped on it with both uh, feet. And, uh, you know, he's tried to clean it up, make it, uh, make it more user-friendly, if you will. And uh, it's hard, though. It's a collision sport. They'll never change that, you know. The, I'll tell you what, what happened is when, when the face mask came on, the leather helmets went away, the face mask came on, guys started to use the helmet as a weapon. The, and, and these human projectiles, you know, and, and, and they were cheered for that. I mean, they were ESPN's hit of the week or, you know, the top hits of the week. You know, they, that, that was a big part of the whole uh, premise of football is, you know, have a big collision, take somebody out, you know, and now – I think the guys are starting to figure it out too, you know, the players. So, uh, whatever they can do to clean that up, I'm not sure they can eradicate all of it because it is a it's a violent football. Football is a violent game, it certainly is. Yes, sir. What's the status of your new stadium that you're trying to build, and has there been a discussion whether the SEC championship will move to that new stadium? Uh, the status of the stadium, as as far as I know it, uh, is it's it they're they're inching closer to an agreement with the Dome Authority. Uh, it's going to be on the south end of where the current dome is now. The, the uh, current dome will be imploded at uh, some point in time. Uh, everything, it'll be a one-stadium solution. So uh, everything, the SEC championship, the Chick-fil-A kickoff game, everything will move that is currently in the uh, Georgia Dome will move over to the new stadium. Well, it will be a retractable roof, which is going to add about $150 million to the cost. Uh, but uh, they're willing to go ahead and absorb that cost and 
you know, there's nothing better than fall days in Atlanta when those cool, crisp days like we're having out there right now, um, having that open air stadium. Uh, Arthur really wants that, and I think uh, we'll have that element, uh, although it will be a retractable roof, just because they don't want another ice bowl like they had at the SEC championship a few years ago. Some of you guys remember that. Uh, anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I did play with Vince Ferragamo. Yep. Vince is in real estate in, in Los Angeles. Uh, he's, he's got a very successful uh, uh, real estate company. And uh, I, see, I see Vince just about every summer. We uh, kind of vacation together on uh, June Jones' golf tournament. June is a good friend of mine and does a uh, golf tournament over in Hawaii. So uh, he, he flies a bunch of the old guys over, and uh, we all get together and uh, – and apply uh, uh, analgesic balm to our knees and so on and so forth. But uh, <laughs> Vince is doing very well. He's, he is, uh, he's a good guy. I like Vince a lot. Yes? What, uh, how did the USFL play into when, when you were playing? Were you contacted by them? How, what was your perception of that league? Yeah, the USFL, I think, wasn't around. Uh, they might have been just uh, – we had the WFL. I remember the World Football League. That, that was around a little bit. And uh, the Canadian Football League, there wasn't uh, – if you wanted to play big time football, there wasn't one place but the National Football League. You know, my attorney tried to get him involved. You know, I think I had a, uh, oh, I don't know, I think maybe a couple free hunts in Canada if I come play for the Argonauts. Or you know, it was, it was uh, it, you know, it's apples to oranges at that point in time. Some guys use it for some real good leverage. Uh, Herschel, I think, got a really good deal from, uh, I think it was Donald Trump that owned the team back in the day up there in the New Jersey Generals, but. Uh, not many guys had a chance to. Uh, Doug Flutie, I think, might have made some money out of there, but uh, whether or not they got paid, I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone else? Real quick. Yes, sir. Are you surprised at how well Peyton Manning has done this Am I surprised at how well Peyton Manning has done? No, nothing about that family surprises me. That's uh, one of the most God-gifted families I've ever been around in all my life. I watched those kids grow up, both he and Eli, and uh, you talk about having a role model for a dad. Archie, there's not a better guy on the face of the earth than Archie Manning. And, uh, you know, uh, Peyton, is a, he's all heart. Um, you know, he doesn't have the physical skills he had five, six, eight years ago, but who of us does? <laughs> you know, I mean, he, uh, he, is, uh, he is the most mentally prepared guy, maybe next to our guy. Our guy is cut in the same cloth, or cut from the same cloth as uh, – as uh, Peyton Manning is, our guy, of course, I referenced Matt Ryan there, but, uh, you know, they, they're just an amazing family, and uh, Peyton is, I knew he was going to be successful. Yes? What is your opinion of Tebow and the New York Jets? Tebow and the New York Jets? Well, I think he, I want him in my locker room. I'm not sure where I'd play him, but I want him in my locker room. He's an incredible kid. Uh, he's a guy that, uh, you know, you can see it means something to him, and, uh, I think that can't help but influence your locker room. I mean, that's, uh, uh, it hadn't seemed to help too much up there in New York. Uh, it could be because of the guy calling the signals up there. And I don't reference Mark, Fran Mark Sanchez on that. I'm thinking that Mr. Ryan doesn't have all his ducks in a row. Um, I'd figure out a way to get him a little bit more involved in the offense. I'm not sure, you know, if it would be carrying the football out of the Wildcat or – uh, but it sure, sure wouldn't be the personal punt protector. I mean, I think I'd have a little larger role than that for him. Yes, sir. What's happened to defenses in college football? They all go to Alabama. They're all, all the good players go to Alabama, I guess. No, it's, it's funny. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day. You know, they, they, I mean, the kids in high school now, they're throwing it around like you read about. I mean, they're, you know, 400 is the new 300 uh, yards passing in the National Football League. I mean, it's just the, the game they figured out that they put air in the football for a reason. If they wanted you on the ground, they'd put sand in it, right? You know? And I think it's just hard to defense. There's so many, there's so many talented people out there in college football right now, you know, and there's so many uh, inventive coaches that are coaching stuff that might not be sound, but they can get away with it on that level, you know? And uh, they're putting up a lot of points as a result. That's a great question. I, I mean, I love defensive football. We saw a defensive game last night. I think it was 19 to 10 or whatever it was. Listen, it's been great to be with y'all. Thank you very much. I know you got jobs to get back to, but thank you for letting me share some time with you.